Question 31. Consider the following table with the spot rates of different currencies. Uh, so we've got the table here. Let's read our question, rest of the question, see what we need to find out. Mitchell, an FX dealer, has quoted the um, CNY GBP spot rate at 0.1. The arbitrage profit that can be earned from transacting CNY GBP is closest to. So it looks like we we need to find um, CNY GBP using these uh, spot rates and then compare that to this 0.1 spot rate that we're getting from the dealer and then we can figure out that arbitrage profit. So just as a reminder, uh, if we want to get to CNY GBP before we start multiplying these, the best thing to do is converting these currencies so that our um, so that our base currency and price currency line up. So we've got USD as the mutual currency here between the two uh, that we're looking at. Um, but to use this spot rate, what we need to do is to get CNY into price currency. So we need to invert this spot rate to move those over. So we'll do one over 7.23. And then we're gonna need to do the same thing here. So we're gonna move USD to the price currency. Um, so we'll do one over uh, 1.27 to get this spot rate. So here's what that ends up. And what that does is basically then we're multiplying CNY USD by USD GBP. And that's going to get us to the spot rate, we the correct spot rate. So let's bring that in. So we've got CNY GBP is going to equal one over this spot rate which is what we just talked about, getting CNY into that price currency. And then we're going to multiply that by 1 over the 1.27 spot rate, which gets um, our pound into the, into the base currency spot. So when we do that, we get 0 0.1089. So then we'll compare that to our um, dealer quote of 0 0.10. So we subtract that out, we get 0 0.0089, and we'll round that up to 0 0.01. Uh, to get, um, sorry, that should say, not say A, B, it should say A. So our correct answer is A. Question 32. Due to the upcoming elections in the US, the CAD USD currency exchange rates have risen from 1.17 to 1.31. So we've got Canadian in our price currency, USD in base. So if this rate increases, what this is telling us is that it used to cost 1.17 Canadian to buy one USD, but now it costs 1.13 Canadian to buy one USD. So the CAD has depreciated and USD has appreciated. So the percentage change in the value of USD in terms of CAD is closest to so we know um, that we're going to have a pot. We should have a positive number here. Since our rate increases, that means USD has appreciated. So our USD in terms of CAD it should be greater. So this is going to be a pretty um, simple return calculation formula since we already have the price currencies how we want them, or since we already have the currency in terms that we want. So we're just going to do 1.31 divided by 1.17 minus 1. That's going to give us 11.97%, um, probably just some rounding errors here. So we'll go with answer B. And so the, the confusing thing here is that if you calculated this as Canadian relative to USD, um, here's what that would have looked like, and it would have gotten you to answer A. Um, so if you did this in terms of Canadian, you would need to invert these spot rates. So you do 1 over 1.31 divided by 1 over 1.17 to flip this. So to do this to, um, to do this opposite, so to do CAD in terms of USD, um, you need to flip these exchange rates um, and have CAD in the uh, base currency to compare that. So when we do that, we invert those, subtract out one, like we did here, uh, we get minus 10.69%, which would have been A. Um, so that's where you could have tripped up there is if you calculated as CAD in terms of USD. But um, we did it as USD in terms of CAD, so we get answer B. All right, question 33. Real money accounts are most likely on which side of the market? The broker, the sell side, or the buy side? So real money... Um, this is no really trick for you or anything, but you just kind of need to remember that this is going to be the buy side. 
And, you know, thinking about this um, from the standpoint of real money, I think what it's getting at is buy side is mutual funds and um, end investors that are buying investments. So this is going to be mutual funds, institutional investors like insurance companies, pension funds. They're buying um, investments for the long term. Whereas on the broker and the sell side, a lot of times these um, this is going to include the market makers and they may be buying, selling stocks within the market, but they're more so just doing it to kind of facilitate trades and take some spread in the middle. Um, so it's not necessarily real, mo real money that they're investing. It's more so they're just kind of taking that spread, making a market. Um, and making their money that way versus the buy side being the real money that's being invested for the long term to kind of make a profit over time. Uh, so we'll go with answer C and that's a little bit on the kind of logic there, how you could remember that. Question 34, two hypothetical currencies, ABC and XYZ are trading at the spot rate of 1.6. If the interest rate in ABC's country is 7% and 5% in XYZ's country, and the actual one-year forward rate is 1.62, which of the following is most accurate? Arbitrage profit does, opportunity does not exist. Arbitrage profit can be earned by buying the forward contract at 1.62, or arbitrage profit can be earned by selling the forward contract at 1.62. So we have our forward rate quote here at 1.62. So essentially we need to calculate the, what the forward rate should be based on the spot and these interest rate differentials um, and then decide whether there's some arbitrage with this forward rate. So I'm going to pull in that formula here. So our forward rate calculation is going to be the spot rate of ABC XYZ. So that'll be our 1.6. And then we're going to multiply that by the interest rate differential between the two. So interest rate will be 1 plus interest rate of ABC 1.07% uh, or 1 plus 7% and then divide that by 1 plus 5%. So here's what that looks like. We get 1.6 times 1.07 over 1.05, which gives us 1.635. So since this does vary from the 1.62, we can determine that there is a arbitrage profit opportunity. Um, so we need to figure out whether we want to buy or sell that forward contract at 1.62. We want to buy low, sell high. So we'll want to buy 1.62 and then we'll uh, realize our profit by the actual um, value ending up being 1.6305. Answer B. Question 34. In which of the following accounting systems would an analyst write down inventories as the lowest value between the cost of inventories and the market price? So this question was pretty difficult, um, kind of tripped me up at first too. So the key here, and it's kind of just based on a technicality. So the key here is lowest cost of inventories and the market price. So pulling in my little chart here, um, gap, we is going to be, we're going to use lower of cost or market price. So that's going to be, um, yes, that will apply to gap. In IFRS, we're also writing down inventories, um, but it's not going to be based on the market. It's going to be based on that net realizable value. Um, so to be honest, at first I was tripped up and thought C would be the answer, but it does turn out to be um, answer B. And so the key here is to kind of remember we're taking lower of cost, but for gap, we've got market. And for IFRS, it's going to be that net realizable value. Answer B. Question 36. Which of the following accounting treatments most likely represents a set of conservative accounting activities? So conservative in this um, context is basically kind of less risky, um, which leads to more likely to kind of understate financial performance. So if surprises happen, this is going to hurt um, performance a lot less than if we're aggressive in our accounting activities. Um, so let's look at these and we'll kind of determine which um, are conservative and which are not. And in each instance, we're given three um, different activities. So we'll just go through each of those one by one. So A, increasing estimates of salvage value. This is going to be not conservative because we're assuming that we're going to get more money for our equipment. Um, 
which is more risky because if we don't get that much money for our salvage value, then that's going to be a hurt, a hit to our um, financials. Decreasing accrual of reserves for bad debts. Um, this is also going to be uh, less conservative or more aggressive. Um, and again, this kind of all comes back to if surprises happen or things don't go in line, then this it uh, negatively affects the financials. So if we're um, decreasing reserves for bad debts, um, that's going to be a more aggressive accounting policy. And then lastly, early recognition of impairments, that um, is a conservative policy there. So if we end up in this instance, if we're early recognizing those impairments, if we end up having getting some recoveries on those, that's going to be a positive for the financials. Um, so we can cross off A since two of these policies are going to be um, aggressive. B, using accelerated depreciation. This is a uh, conservative policy because we're basically realizing more expenses in the current period, which lowers our earnings. Um, but technically, cash flow is higher. Uh, decreasing valuation allowances on deferred tax assets. Um, this is not going to be a, a conservative policy. And then lastly, expensing current period costs. Um, that is a, um, that's a good policy. So we've got two good, one not so far. Let's make sure C um, is more conservative. So C, early recognition of impairment, that's good, like we uh, set up here for answer A. Um, and then increasing valuation allowances on tax deferred assets. So that's the opposite of what we got up here, um, which is a conservative policy. And then using accelerated depreciation already established up here as conservative. So we've got three good here, and we'll go with answer C. Question 37, which of the following activities will most likely increase cash flow from operations? So we've got three activities here, and then our answers are different combinations of those activities. So let's look at these, one, two, and three. So A, 334,000 increase in accounts receivable. So um, when we're looking at these activities, we want to know which ones are going to increase, increase cash flow. So an increase in accounts receivable basically means that we have more um, IOUs on our sales than previously. So this is actually going to decrease cash flow um, because we're going to have less cash coming in from those sales than we had in previous periods. So we can go ahead and cross that off. Um, so in reality, any activities, any of these that have one in them, we can go ahead and get rid of. So we could get rid of A and B and go with C if we were pretty pressed for time um, on the actual exam. But let's go through and make sure we can confidently go with... Um, uh, Answer C, activities two and three. So A, 250,000 decrease in inventories. Um, inventories decreasing indicates more sales, so that should lead to um, more cash flow coming in. Um, so that seemed good right so far. And then A, 600,000 increase in accounts payable. So accounts payable are um, payments that we owe to other vendors or suppliers. So if we put off the payment of those um, to some later date, then this should also increase our current cash flow from operations. Um, so we can confidently stick with C. Activities two and three will increase cash flow. All right, question 38. For tax purposes, LexCorp uses straight line depreciation to depreciate one of its assets. For financial reporting purposes, the company applies the accelerated depreciation method if the asset was purchased for $550,000 and has a 10-year useful life with a salvage value of $0, the tax base of the asset um, at the end of the first year is closest to. So we're looking at the tax base of the asset at the end of the first year. We're doing 10-year um, straight line depreciation um, to depreciate those asset that asset. Um, so what we're going to be doing here is our tax base is basically going to be the cost of the asset minus that depreciation amount. Um, since we're depreciating one year and then at the end of that first year, that'll be our tax base asset. So our depreciation amount is going to be the cost of the asset minus salvage over useful life. We've got salvage value of $0. 
Um, so our depreciation yearly is 55,000. So at the end of that first year, we'll take our cost minus that first year depreciation gives us our tax base of 495. Answer C. Question 39. Which of the following most likely indicate accounting manipulations in the financial statements? A. Company E's sales are 40% lower than the sales of Company F. Both are engaged in the production of TV shows. Um, just because two companies are in the same industry doesn't mean they're going to have the same amount of sales. So there's definitely no uh, indication of manipulation here. B, Company C operates in providing telecom services and does not show a transmission cost, whereas Company D is engaged in the same industry and has substantial transition costs. So there could be some manipulation um, here uh, without knowing anything extra. Um, we don't know how important transition, we might not know how important transmission costs are to telecom. Um, but one company having none, whereas another company having substantial may indicate some uh, manipulation there. Let's look at C and see if that's a better answer or not. Uh, company A does not show an increase in capital assets, whereas company B operates in the same industry and has increased its capital assets by 50%. Both companies are engaged in financial consulting. So there's not necessarily manipulation here either. They're in the same industry, um, but for from a capital asset standpoint, they may just be on different capex cycles um, where they're needing to spend on different things, and they may be growing at different rates as well. So if company B is um, growing substantially, they may be increasing their capital assets to kind of support that growth, whereas company A may be... Um, slowing down or not having the same type of growth that company B is, they might not need more assets to, uh, you know, be steadily where they're at. Um, for, so for those couple reasons, I think we can rule out C and we'll stick with B as uh, manipulation based on these costs not being there for company C. Question 40. Maybe Incorporated is a male fashion brand based in Italy. Ahmed is an analyst working on the cash flow statement of maybe using the direct method. So we've got sales, cost of goods sold, interest expenses, depreciation expenses, decrease in accounts receivable, increase in accounts payable, and increase in interest payable. Using the financial data provided in the table, the cash collection, cash collected from customers of maybe incorporated is closest to $20, $140, or $160. So we've got a lot of information here in this table, but there's only two variables we need to look at for cash collections. One is sales, and then two is the um, change in accounts receivable. So if we have a decrease in accounts receivable of $10, that means that we had $10 more of cash come in, and then all of our sales were cash um, sales as well. So basically our cash collections is sales plus decrease in accounts receivable, uh, which gets us 160 So we go with answer C. And just notice if the decrease in accounts receivable number was negative, uh, so basically increase in accounts receivable, um, that would turn this to a negative number, so that would decrease our cash collections.